Well, calm, but not with respect to Heisenberg. And we're drinking, well, Jung and Pauli drank quite a bit in their evenings together where they discussed literally everything in the universe. And Pauli was always seen at parties, glass in hand. He said that uh, alcohol helped him through his, helped him with his bouts of depression. Pauli always noted that he had become a better person after his analysis with Jung. Well, Jung often said that uh, uh, one third of his patients were cured, one third helped, and the other one third was a disaster. Pauli fell somewhere in the middle. Jung's and Pauli's was a truly unique meeting of the mind. And Jung liked to recall that with Pauli, he could enter the no man's land between physics and the psychology of the unconscious, the most fascinating, yet the darkest hunting ground of our times. And what I've given you is, is a linear exposition of a, of a complex story concerning two complex people. For more, I invite you to read my book, uh, Deciphering the Cosmic Number, which there are some copies outside, and you can also order if, if they're out. Thank you very much. Remembering I am feel as a physicist, one would like from these greats of the past, I have never seen Pauline or Heisenberg, to learn something. Uh, that's why also there is this interest, even how often they married and, and what they did with women, if one is a man. Now, the question to you would well, be... Well, let me just interrupt before. Uh, that's also important, because these were, well, that, these were complicated people. electric interest in whether Pauli was feeling well with Jung or Jung with Pauli. I don't find this personally oh. very interesting. Never mind. But my question to you is yeah. more what positive can these stories have okay, the, the young people who look yeah. to be a Pauli or two Paulis, well, the, like a, a scientist or something more modest. The positivity of this is that um, uh, complex people have complex lives and the dynamics behind their lives. Um, great, uh, you know, the really great physicists, okay, I and mean, we all try to be great physicists, you know, but just that 1% up there, you know, the Einsteins, the Bohrs, the Paulis, the Heisenbergs, uh, they don't sit all day and scratch out equations, okay? They live an interdisciplinary life. I mean, interdisciplinary is something that's stressed today more than ever, but uh, a lot of people just don't do it. They don't even seem to know how to do it. Uh, but these people read across a wide variety of subjects, philosophy, literature, politics, uh, psychology, um, poetry, and this helped them in their thinking. So that's one thing that you can learn from, from them. Um, but you can also learn, for example, from Pauli is perhaps not to be as critical as he was. Perhaps he was so critical he just saw out the other side of a, of a, uh, a problem and to be more adventurous, such, such as Heisenberg and et cetera. But you could also learn for a, a, negative, a, a negative point about Bohr, who was considered, who pe most people considered to be a saint, but really wasn't a very nice guy in, in a lot of ways to a lot of people, especially to, to Pauli. Uh, so, you know, you learn also from uh, reading their original papers, from reading their uh, um, autobiographies, auto autobiographical notes, to see, how these, to see how these people live. I'm not saying you have to emulate their lives, to see how these people live and see the passion with which they address their subjects. Uh, sorry, um, I wanted just to understand one thing you said. I mean, you said that um, essentially uh, Pauli was undergoing analysis from 1933 to 1934 yes. at Jung, and that he dreamt something like 320 dreams. Yeah, 355, like, yeah. Right? And then 50 more dreams and 45, overall, there were more besides, yeah, right, so, yeah. Um, uh, what strikes me, and this is the first question, then I have another yeah. one, is that he was dreaming in a row for one year. Yeah. You know, just uh, 
probably every evening. Is that true? I mean, That's right. Yeah, he dreamt. Yeah, he was in. He was an assiduous dreamer. Uh, no, sometimes people. Okay. Sometimes people did worry about him. And in fact, Franca, Franca, when he died, Franca, when he died, committed a real literary crime in that uh, she ripped up. Uh, she destroyed what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, whatever dream she could find of his. But she was not interested in him. When he would discuss his dreams with her in the morning, she would just say, "I don't want to hear it." Um, but he. Uh, wrote up these dreams. Um, they're right now, unfortunately, one can't see them. Well, Jung, the way I describe Pauli's dreams, let me say uh, that is the way Jung, this is the way that Jung describes the, uh, uh, the analysis. Jung didn't keep minutes of, of, of his analysis. He recalled them, and uh, in his, in his uh, uh, long, long paper, uh, Psychology and Alchemy, he describes Pauli's dreams. And there are other, without mentioning his names, there are other unpublished sets of lectures he gave where he almost gave it away, but not quite. People like Fierce uh, uh, strongly suspected that it was, it was Pauli who was the um, analysis. But Pauli was an assiduous dreamer, and as soon as he could in the morning, wrote him up. Uh, of course, there's this quantum, quantum mechanical effect of the observer, you know, that you do uh, change it a little bit, but he tried to get the coloration just straight, just right, and drew pictures too, which unfortunately, uh, they're closed to the public now. Only, only one person uh, is looking at them and is putting them together, and apparently they, they will be out uh, uh, next year. Another person, and incidentally, while uh, talking about dreams, Federico Fellini, it turned out, had been analyzed, also analyzed by Jung, and his dreams with his drawings just came out. So be interested to compare uh, the two. I mean, the two are highly, highly creative. And, 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 and at that great creative moment, boundaries dissolve, I believe, between all disciplines. And so it would be interesting to see what Fellini has to say as well. Did I answer your first question? Uh, sorry, uh, the other question was just a very stupid one. I, you mentioned uh, a co-authorized paper by uh, Heisenberg and Ascoli, probably, you wanted to say, yes. as an Italian physicist. Uh, I didn't know that there was a, a co-authorized paper of those Yes, two. oh yeah, 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 he, uh, yeah it, it does exist. You look in, um, it was published, but I, I, saw it, I saw the version in Heisenberg's collected works. I see. Yeah, in one of Heisenberg's later collected works. It, it's, in, it's interesting reading, actually. Sorry, I'm not sure if this is the same question, but so y there was a paper by uh, Pauli and Heisenberg, which is, I'm, as far as I'm able to tell, was never published. Yes, it wasn't, uh, as far as I know. How do I find it? Uh, in Heisenberg's collected works, the same volume as the uh, Ascoli uh, uh, paper. It, it's, uh, it's a little bit disturbing to hear that uh, a great hero of physics like Pauli believed in nonsense like Jungian psychology. And can I, can that's I, rather, can that's I rather dismissive. An, can I propose an alternative uh, theory? Huh? You know, can I propose an alternative theory? Sure. This is, a, this is an irascible man who has very few friends, and there's another man who has a professional desire to spend a lot of time with them. And so Polly says, I can put up with this nonsense if I get to talk to somebody for a few hours a day. No, it wasn't like that at all. Uh, they had uh, the face-to-face, -face, I mean, it, it's something, it's where a, it began as a, their relationship began as a, a doctor-patient relationship, then uh, grew into a colleagueship and blossomed into a, a friendship. Uh, Pauli had lots of friends, that isn't quite true, that uh, he was selective and is hardly selective, more selective than, than people generally are. Um, he, he didn't like small talk and, and uh, in dinners, he um, you know was highly selective on who he had dinner with too. But he had lots of uh, people to to talk to. There was no problem there. And he was uh, um, when he was a student, he became int very interested in Kepler uh, through his uh, teacher Sommerfeld. Um, Kepler, the harmony of the spheres, and um, emphasis on on whole numbers, on uh, integers, and read into Kepler. Um, and was uh, amazed at when he read Kepler's, particularly Kepler's book where Kepler's third law is in it, he was amazed at how Kepler worked in that uh, uh, Kepler would uh, essentially tell you what he was doing that day, whether he had an argument with his wife, and, uh, uh, and then he would do a little physics and then go back to uh, discussions of alchemy and so on. And in that, um, in that book, um, Kepler has a long, 
diatribe with Robert Flood, who was a Rosicrucian. And you can see Kepler discussing deep points in alchemy uh, 